Thank you. Uh, let me put this down here. Yeah, and so this talk is called Join the Duocracy, and I'll kind of explain what that is when I get into it. Um, uh, I'm an agent with a group called Telecomics. Um, is anybody here actually on IRC right now? Uh, IRC.telecomics.org um, is, is our IRC. If you want to start an OS Bridge channel or just hang out, that'd be really cool. Um, and so while I work with this group, I speak just for myself. And so whatever opinions I have here are mine, and I'm not, not any sort of official spokesperson. Um, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I program Python. I ride bikes. I cook. I do yoga. And I just want to say, I love this town. This place is awesome. I mean, yeah, Portland. It's just, I've been here for a couple of days, and it's really just been, been absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, and so before I get started, I just want to say that the last month has been a little pear-shaped, to say the least. Um, I'm living in rural Washington right now. The only road to my house flooded out. I've had three external hard drives die. My laptop died this morning. Um, I was getting off the couch when the alarm went off at 12 o'clock last night to work on the slides, and I like bashed my elbow on the coffee table. And so, I just patience with me. And so, I hope I hope that you will take this as an exercise in communication in the face of adversity. And so, sometimes when we have things that you know we need to say or get out there, it's more important to do so timely than kind of and with a lot of polish. And so. Just maybe keep that in mind as I go through this today. Um, and so while I'd hope to come up here and give some answers, I think I'm going to have to settle for asking questions. Um, and so one of the questions I want to ask about is, is what does this word hacker mean? I mean, that's a news word that's been in the news a lot. I mean, we call ourselves hacker. And so what is this? And so somewhat relatedly, people have started calling me a hacktivist. And so this is sort of a, a new term, um, at least for me. And I'm just trying to figure out what, what quite that, that means. And so I think these names are important. And so the meaning of words, I think, right now is very much up, up for contest, and it's up for debate, you know? And yeah, so what, what does that word mean, to hack? And so the best answer I've been able to give about what I do as a hacktivist is been in the form of a lightning talk. I really like lightning talks. I love lightning talks. I love the fact that you get five minutes to boil down what you have to say in sort of its bare, bare essence. And so one of the things I'm doing at OS Bridge this year is I volunteered to facilitate the lightning talks. We'll have a sign-up sheet up uh, outside if you have something you want to say about it for five minutes, I think Tuesday evening. Yeah, we'd love to hear it. Uh, this morning. Oh, OK. Apparently right now on Wednesday. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to hear that. And so I'm just going to give my lightning talk, um, because that's about the most polished thing I have right now. Um, yeah, and so here it goes. Um, as I said, my name is Pete Fine, and I've been hacking for freedom. I use the word hack in its, oh, oh, yeah. I use the word hack in its original sense to mean a clever technical trick using a system in a way its designer didn't intend. This video is from Tunisia. It appears to show a flamethrower being used to disperse protesters. What I find compelling here is not the violation of the Geneva Conventions, but the phones. People desperately trying to get word out to show the world what's happening. And that's why information needs to be free, right there in grainy, glorious cell phone video. If we cannot see, we cannot act. I'm an agent with Telecomics, an ad hoc disorganization of volunteer internauts who facilitate free communication for everyone, regardless of political affiliation. Comprised of programmers, punks, politicians, pirates, and others, Telecomics believes in person-to-person -person communication, the original P2P. I sometimes act as a liaison to anonymous, opportunistically forging connections and collaborations in the service of common goals. On that note, let me go on record and state I don't DDoS, deface websites, or crack passwords. 
And if the FBI is watching this, fuck you. <laughs> Telecomics is yin to anonymous is yang. If anonymous takes sites down, telecomic keeps them up. We're builders instead of breakers. What these groups have in common with each other and with the protests on the ground is that they are truly leaderless and possessed by a radical passion for freedom. We operate as a duocracy, a form of organization in which the people who get things done get things done. Here's a little bit of what telecomics did for Egypt. During the Jan 25 revolution, the Mubarak regime caused a nearly total blackout of internet, mobile, and SMS service. While the net was up, telecomics provided tools such as Tor, VPNs, and other encryption for safe communication. To restore access to censored sites, we built mirrors and proxies. Using the old school chat IRC, we served as a manual relay to Twitter, tweeting for Egyptians who were unable to do so themselves. When the net was down, we went low tech. When countries block, we devolve. We worked with ISPs and individual users to set up hundreds of dial-up modem lines. These numbers are currently active for Syria as well. We recruited amateur radio operators from around the globe to help establish radio communication. Working with Anonymous, we sent comms and medical information, including treatments for tear gas, to every fax machine in Egypt we could find. We also set up a reverse fax service for transmitting news out of the country. We used the network tool Nmap to scan the entire Egyptian IP address space and find a few thousand machines that were still up. We then injected human-readable messages into their web server logs. <laughs> yeah, right? And so some of our future development projects include intranet live CDs using off-the-shelf hardware to run a local Usenet, a wiki of analog street communication tactics such as wheat pasting and sign making, and how-tos for building two-ray radios from repurposed consumer electronics. We've been able to reuse much of this work in Libya, Syria, Iran, Yemen, Bahrain, and Wisconsin. <laughs> Which was good, because after working 20 hours a day for eight days on Egypt, I really needed some sleep. This is an exciting time to be a person who can use a computer. The cause of freedom calls all of us, not only programmers, but writers and artists, academics and filmmakers, philosophers, and trolls. We have the power to make a real difference in the world, to help people achieve what they want for themselves. It's been a long, long winter for freedom in the Middle East and the rest of the world, but we're beginning to see signs of spring. We are Telecomics. Join us. Woohoo, thank you. And so that's my little. Lightning talk within a talk. Um, yeah. And so I said earlier that I'm an agent for telecomics, and I'm speaking for, um, only for myself. But I want to try to explain a little bit about why we did what we did there. Um, and I think it basically boils down to the fact that we believe that free speech is the basis of a free society. That sort of every person who has an opinion deserves to have that opinion heard. And we want to help make that possible. Let me be perfectly clear here. While we've largely been working with people protesting in the Middle East and fighting censorship elsewhere, we think all of the opinions out there are important. And so that means if there's somebody who's a fan of Gaddafi, who you know, has something he wants to tell the world, we'll help that person too. Um, you know, we're not, we're not going to take sides. Um, you know, we're not going to do anything violent either. I mean, we just we facilitate communication. Um, that communication, that ability to share ideas, is, is the foundation of effective democracy. We can have the vote all we want. We can elect whoever we want. We can donate wherever we want. But unless we're able to talk to one another and sort of work out what it is that we collectively want to do, those things don't matter. 
And so that's, I think, at the heart, the heart of what we do. And so the internet certainly plays a large part of that. We use other communications technologies when we can, but the last six, eight months have really shown the internet to be a force for freedom and free communication uh, in a way that's really, really been quite dramatic. And so it's a little disturbing to see the internet under attack. And you know, I think that we're used to thinking of that as just governments in China and the Middle East, but it's not that there. It's here. It's in France. It's all these different places. And so while Egypt does something fairly coarse, like literally pulling, pulling the fiber optic cable, the only fiber optic cable that runs into the country out of the wall, the censorship we see in the West is a little more subtle. Um, and so, you know, I can definitely sit here and talk about the WikiLeaks domain seizure. There's a grand jury trial going on in Virginia for volunteers and supporters of Bradley Manning, people who have never worked, worked directly with WikiLeaks, getting called up and asked to testify about what five years ago, 10 years ago, we would have considered normal political activity. And so where the internet comes in, like I said, you know, with these WikiLeaks domains, and so it's not, not just WikiLeaks. Um, there's a bill going through Congress right now called Protect IP, which would more or less allow copyright holders to cause the domains of websites, mostly foreign, to just be seized, just outright seized by the US government, three days notice, no court appeal. If you're away for three days on vacation and you don't get your email, domain, gone, right? This is fundamentally breaking the infrastructure of the internet. Um, the worst part is here that the Department of Homeland Security, in the name of protecting copyright, hasn't even waited for this bill to pass. They've seized over 1,000 domains since last Thanksgiving, right? Not just the US, all over the world, we're seeing governments censoring, filtering, blocking, restricting the internet. I mean, this isn't anything really new here. There's been a long, long history of you know, attempts to kind of control and restrict digital communication, crypto exports, you know, copyright enforcement, wiretapping, sort of all these things, things we worry about. And so I'd like to say that I'm surprised, but I'm really not. You know. Um, Lauren Strickling, who's Obama's Undersecretary for Commerce in 2010, said, leaving the internet alone has been the nation's internet policy since it was first commercialized in the mid-90s. That was then, and this is now. Right? This is a little over a year ago. And I think we've seen what now looks like in, in these people's eyes. This fight is so important because the net's sort of eaten all of these other modes of communication, right? It scales better, it's cheaper, and so it's eaten CDs. It's eaten television, it's eaten books, right? It's largely eaten newspapers. It's really hard to imagine something that comes after this. I don't want to be all the end of history here, but you know, even, even with radical, crazy technology like brain implants, whatever. Um, you know, the internet, it's already in space, right? There's already the internet on the ISS and the space station. And so all of that content, all of those basic systems, right, TCP IP, the domain name system, these are the foundations for the communication medium of the future. And so if we look at the past, these kind of new communication technologies have always been a threat to, to people and institutions in power. Um, and you know, governments and kind of corporations, large businesses, have responded to this with repression and restriction. Um, you know, the printing, you know, the internet is young, it's early. Like, we forget it's only 15 years old since most of us really had access. And so if you look at some of these other technologies, the printing press, um, amateur radio, you know, it took anywhere from 100 years to 30 years for these things to kind of really get clamped down. Um, and so, yeah, um, I think that's what we're, we're starting to see, see now. Um, this fight is important. If we can't communicate, we can't organize. If we can't organize, we can't resist. If we can't resist, 
instead of citizens, will be subjects. Our lives and our destinies determined by those people who have the power to control communication. And so we're starting to see some resistance. Um, I think this is what Anonymous is about, right? Um, like I said, I do some work with Anonymous. I don't hack things, but I hang out. You know, I hang out, I write some propaganda, I see where there are kind of opportunities for, you know, me to contribute. And so I think what Anonymous is doing is, is sort of pushing back against what, what we perceive to be kind of the loss of this ability to communicate. Um, and so how we get from, you know, people protesting both for Scientology and, you know, against Scientology and in support of WikiLeaks, that under the same group is people doing DDoS, people hacking sites, defacing sites, and now merging up with LulzSec, right? When I first gave that lightning talk two weeks ago, nobody had heard of LulzSec. It is amazing to me how quickly things are moving here. And since then, they have 200,000 Twitter followers. They've DDoSed the CIA. They hacked the British equivalent of the FBI for computer crimes. Um, they took down magnets.com because they couldn't get an answer as to how magnets worked. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, um, this is now merged into a movement, movement called anti-sec. Um, and so anti-sec is basically the low security guys and anonymous have more or less declared info war on all governments. They're going to DDoS sites. They're going to hack sites. They're going to leak things. This is crazy. What, what's happened here? I mean, in just the last six months, like what, what has gone on um, you know, that sort of we're now seeing the internet on one side in the form of Egypt and Lulzsec and Anonymous and telecomics and you know, governments on the other. I mean, just to, to have thought of that two years ago would have been almost inconceivable. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's because the internet facilitates certain things. Um, it makes, you know, it, the internet didn't cause the protests in Egypt. It hasn't caused the protests in the Middle East, but it is certainly facilitating them, and it's making them possible. And so I talk about these, these phenomena as being sort of anarchic processes in a way. And so, you know, that's a, that's a big word to throw around. You know, I think most, this is what most of America thinks about anarchy. I mean, go, go look up anarchist under Google Images, and you get people like throwing bombs, and okay, dudes throwing flowers. And so this is Portland, and I think we can have a little more, more mature conversation here. And so what I want to talk about is not overthrowing governments, because it's really just not, not my scene. I'm not all that excited by it. But sort of what could be termed anarchic organizing. And if you've never experienced something like this, it's kind of hard to imagine how anonymous actually works. Um, or how the protests actually work. Uh, and I think you know, the media's response to this is they keep looking for leaders. They keep looking for, for somebody that they can point a finger at and the cops can haul away. And it just simply doesn't work like that. And so in most of our day-to-day -day lives, we're used to having there somebody be there who can tell us what to do, who tells us what to do. And if we don't follow that, there are consequences. And so in school, that's teachers, or you get sent to the principal's office, or you get sent to detention. Um, we've got bosses who can fire us from a job, cops who take you to jail if you don't pay your taxes. And so this is what anarchists mean by hierarchy, right? It's just the system where that there are consequences for you if you don't follow orders or directions from a particular person. And so Anonymous, and to a degree the protests, are, are non-hierarchical organizations. And so what, what do these things look like? How do they work? Um, and so I'd like to introduce the concept of a disorganization. And so when everybody's a volunteer, when everybody on Anonymous IRC is there because they want to be there, how do you actually do things constructively? Like, how do you actually get people moving in the same direction? And so you have to do something totally different. Because if you tell them what to do, they're going to tell you to shove off, and then they're just going to go do something else, or they're going to leave. And so I want to go through some kind of the tactics that kind of come up 
come up in this sortification. And so the first characteristic is radical openness. And so there's been a lot of talk about anonymous and their secret IRC chat layers, you know, striking out and selling their lulz bolts around and causing havoc on the internet. If you Google for anonymous IRC, the first hit you will get is one of the anonymous IRC networks. And you can go and you can join in and you can talk to the people who, you know, plan protests and they can send you off to the people where, I mean, the lulzsec public IRC channel is that, it is public. And so, yeah, the, the, that brings with it some advantages, it brings with some disadvantages. Um, and one of the advantages is that there's participation, right, that sort of if you also want to go tell them that you think they're being idiots, you can do that. Um, yeah, and so not hidden, not hidden at all. Um, when you're working like this, where you just have people showing up and volunteering for a while and then leaving, uh, we use a system that I like to call adhocracy. And so this is the formation of temporary working groups to just go out and sort of something they're interested in, you put a team together and you go, go do it. Um, IRC, IRC is the big one here. I think this is a fine example of the tool, way the tools of the internet can be used to facilitate particular kinds of collaboration. Um, I'd love to be giving you a demo right now. I don't have Wi-Fi set up. Um, I'm going to do a, a hack open space session on sort of just an introduction to IRC, what's out there, how to be safe, how to participate. I think the most important, important thing that groups like Anonymous do, that the protests do, that Telecomics does, is a concept I call duocracy. And so rather than a formal system of hey, you fill out these TPS reports, I'll make copies, go buy coffee. People just show up and they just do. And that is sort of the highest organizational principle, is that you can come up with whatever structures or ways of working that you want, but at the end of the day, what matters is what you get done. And so I think there are So I think there are a lot of different examples of other organizations or disorganizations in real life that follow this. Um, this is video from Critical Mass. And so I know this is not going to be a big deal here because this is Portland. But Critical Mass has been going on for over 20 years in 300 cities worldwide with no centralized leadership. The Chicago ride, which this is, gets 3,000 people in the summer. I know that's not a big deal here. I mean, I know you guys had 10,000 naked people on bicycles just this weekend. Um, but yeah, that's a fairly impressive, impressive history for something that has no centralized structure, no, no formal process, no leaders. People just go out and they do. We just go out, we ride bikes, that's what we do. Um, some other things, I think Burning Man works like that. You might say Burning Man is just a big hippie party in the desert. You wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> but you have to remember that while that party is going on, it is the third largest city in Nevada. That there's over 65,000 people surviving, prospering, partying in this harsh desert environment where the only things you can buy are ice and coffee. <laughs> And so lots and lots of models. I think that open source fits this model too, right? Where's the code? Show up, show me a patch, right? And even this conference, right? This is, this is a shot of the volunteers yesterday figuring out what they're gonna do, right? People are just literally, as we sit here as, all day, you know, the day I was here yesterday, what can I do? How can I help? How can I make this conference happen? And that's impressive, impressive. Um, it's in the same model, though certainly not at scale, as sort of the protests in Tahrir Square. And so, you know, in Tahrir Square, not only do they get these, all these people out, but they set up a medical tent. They set up a barber shop. Uh, I met actually one of the organizers from the youth movements when I was in the UK two weeks ago. Um, they set up a stage where people, for the first time in 50 years, could get up and speak their opinion. Um, 
Wisconsin, right? Anybody know the protests are still going on in Wisconsin? Anybody know that? Yeah, the Saturday farmer's market has now turned into the Saturday's farmer's market in protest. 3,000, 5,000 people. Um, and so I have a friend, friend from there, and we're talking about it. And so the same, same sort of things, medical tents, massage tents, a dance troupe. Uh, the people in Spain have, occupying a square in Barcelona, have started planting gardens at their protest site. Um, yeah, this is, this is all example of this phenomenon I call duocracy, right? You just go out, you just do. I want to tell a little, little story here. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Portland and a little about, about doing. Um, Lauren Lessig of Creative Commons gave this fantastic talk at OzCon in 2002 here, here in Portland uh, about the expansion of copyright and software patents and the war on file sharing and the damage this was doing to us as programmers and as a culture. And so I've, I've been up here and I've been talking for a while. And so I'm actually just going to run a clip of, of this talk. Um, and so it's about a minute and a half. And I think this is, this is the climax, climax of this, this fantastic, fantastic speech. We've not done anything yet. A lot of energy building sites and blogs and slash dot stories. Nothing yet to change that vision in Washington. Because we hate Washington, right? Who would waste his time in Washington? But if you don't do something now, this freedom you built, that you spend your life coding, this freedom will be taken away. Either by those who see you as a threat, who then invoke the system of law we call patents, or those who take advantage of the extraordinary expansion of control that the law of copyright now gives them over innovation, either of these two changes through law will produce a world where your freedom has been taken away. And if you can't fight for your freedom, you don't deserve it. But you've done nothing. There's a handful, we can name them. The people you could be supporting, you could be taking. Like just, you know, here, just take this, put this in perspective. How many people have given to EFF? Okay. How many people have given to EFF more money than they give to their local telecom to give them shitty DSL service? And so I think that's a really good question, right? And so what, what have we done? What have we done to Fight, fight for freedom in this digital age. And his answer seems to be that we're supposed to give money to the EFF. I love the EFF. Believe I know there's some EFF members here. I think they do fantastic, fantastic work. Don't get me wrong. But I have a kind of a problem with that, that sort of our participation in our fight for our freedom is to give, to give a money, to write a check. That's a, that's a bumper sticker culture. You write a check. You get a bumper sticker, you put it on your car, that's your politics. And so what I want to do is compare this situation to, to an organization called the Pirat Biran, which, and so at right around the same time, Sweden was dealing with much the same issues of copyright law and patents and IP. Uh, and so Pirat Biran was a disorganization. They described themselves as a conversation or a think tank um, advocating for piracy. Uh, and the rights of file sharers. And so they actually went out and protested. Like hundreds of hundreds of people marched around Stockholm and Gothenburg and, and protested for what they believed to be their future. Um, and so they not only said, we want the file sharing rights that we've had, and we want to keep that status quo, but they went further, and they demanded 100 megabit internet to their homes, all right? He said social, their phrase was social welfare begins at 100 megabit. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And so they, aside, from, aside from making these, these demands, um, they also built things. And so they built a whole lot of different things. Um, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. But one of the things that came out of this movement, out of this conversation, was the Pirate Bay. 
And so they went out and not only said, we want, we want file sharing rights, they actually built a tool that showed to the, the people in Sweden why this is relevant and what a free and open internet can actually do. And as a consequence, they won. They won. I, I had the opportunity to visit Sweden, and for $30 a month in every major city, most of the small ones, it's a fairly sparsely populated country, there is bi-directional 100 megabit connection to your house, to your house. Not only do they have one of the most relaxed copyright regimes in the world, they have, as a consequence of these actions, some of the fastest internet. And if you just think, you think sort of, compare that to what's in the States, where 30 bucks gets you a meg and a half, maybe three, just what, what that kind of connectivity makes possible. The other thing is that it even gets even better, is that in 2006, they started a political party called, called the Pirate Party. And they've even been successful enough that they now have two MEPs. They have two Swedish members of the Pirate Party sit in the governing parliament of Europe. And so I look at what's happened in Sweden, I look at what's happened in the States, and it's just hard, hard to not draw some comparisons. And I think the moral of this allegory is that direct action gets the goods. Is that by going out and just doing, and putting our hands and our skills and our voices and our feet to work directly in service of whatever that goal is we want to achieve works better. It works better than writing a check. You know, Gandhi said that we should be the change we want to see in the world. Um, that rather than waiting around for someone to come save us, we should just go out and start today. And so in Egypt, Telecomics did exactly this. We didn't call up Obama to call Hillary, to call Mubarak, to say, please turn the internet back on. Please turn the internet back on. No, we just busted out some modems and some fax machines and whatever it is we had and we could find and could put together to make communication possible. And so, like I said, I was at this other conference in the UK two weeks ago, and I went to this event called UK Uncut. And so UK Uncut organizes independently on Twitter um, and are protesting basically large companies, Vodafone, large retailers who don't pay their taxes and so are causing the kind of destruction of the NHS and the British social welfare system. And so this woman actually, at the end of her talk, takes half of, half of the audience and we march down the street and go into a Vodafone office and do a protest right there. And we actually even finish the talk in, in this Vodafone office kind of at the protest, right? And so, yeah, they're getting some attention, they're getting some coverage. Um, just rather than just complaining, they are showing kind of what could be possible. And so I think that the internet here, if we want it to be a tool for social justice or a tool for freedom or whatever it is we want to do with it, needs to be more than just an echo chamber. We need to do more than just post stories on our blogs and Twitter and Slashdot. If the only outlet we have is online, we're shouting in vain. Sometimes you need to just get outside and get your message out. Right? There's this echo chamber effect. Right? We're all plugged in, we follow the people we follow on Twitter, we read the sites we read, and sort of how can we go out and advocate for what we need and what we believe is right to people who are not listening? And so let's talk about surveillance. Let's talk about surveillance and politics. And so I understand that we are anxious about going out and protesting and being political in the face of this so much surveillance, right? These cameras are just everywhere. And to say nothing of the photos that people take ourselves, right, and that wind up in, on Facebook. 
And I'd like to quote a woman named Sherry Turkle. She wrote a fantastic book called Alone Together about sociology and the internet and kind of what it, what it is cell phones and all these things are doing to our culture. And she quotes this young man who says, the internet definitely makes you think about going to a protest. You can't tell where the pictures would show up. And I think we worry about that. I mean, even those of us who are older and a little more active, right, we're afraid. And I think we have reason to, to be, sometimes. If that's a problem for you, I understand. So put on a mask, right? If you're afraid of your face showing up, put on a mask. If you don't like this mask, there are lots of other masks, OK? <laughs> but no more excuses. What can you do? What can you do? You can protest. You can ride a bike, grow garden, hack code, call your mom. I don't care. I don't care. But do something. The government, the corporations, are not going to make this world better for us. And we cannot keep relying on someone else to fix it for us. We need to start doing this ourselves. It's better that way. It's better that way. Because that way, we have direct input into the sort of world we want to live in. Don't give up. It's hard. But if you join the bureaucracy, what can you do? Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Please pirate this talk.